welcome to the Greg Steer Youth Ministry Podcast. I believe in the power of the gospel and the potential of teens. And I also believe that the best way to get teens to grow is to get them to go. So excited. Uh, I have some friends here today, uh, youth ministry friends, uh, Tyree Sterling, Pauline Ebert, Eric Rosinger. And we're going to really unpack uh, kind of the, go- the new and updated Gospelized book uh, that I just uh, revised, updated, and released. We'll talk a little bit about that. It's got some really exciting changes. But uh, first of all, let's just kind of go around the room and introduce ourselves, name, your church or ministry, location, how long you've been connected with this whole concept of gospelizing or gospel advancing. Hey there, I am Pastor Pauline Eber. I am the youth pastor at Fusion Community Church in Cobleskill, New York, which is upstate New York. I've been there now for seven years, and I've been a gospel advancing leader, and we've been a gospel advancing ministry for the last five years now. Very, very excited to be here, so thank you. Awesome. Hey, Tyree, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, My name is Tyree Sterling. I'm a part of Lifehouse Church in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, where I am one of the youth leaders, and I've been with um, Gospel Advancing Ministry since Lead the Cause was called Lead the Cause University a um, long time ago. I want to say at least over nine years. Yep. Um, I, I believe it was. So, yeah, it's been a it's been a blessing to my life. That's awesome. Definitely, Eric. Yeah. Hey, I'm Eric Grosinger. Thanks for letting me uh, be a part of the conversation. I'm the pastor of student ministries at Faith Bible Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the northeast corner of the state. Um, been doing that for eight years, been in ministry over 20. Um, gospel advancing probably for the last seven of those, I would say. Um, just really jumping on board, just really seeing how powerful that is, but also just the, the impact that has too. So love the conversation today. That's awesome. I just, I love the idea of gospel advancing, you know, gospel centered sounds like we're just going to exegete it. Gospel advancing uh, sounds like we're going to execute it. Like we're going to do this. We're not just sitting in a half circle, you know, watching, you know, Matt Chandler videos and, you know, John (laughs) Piper exegete the gospel. We're putting them on our podcast and we're advancing it, right? We're going for it and seeing our students advance the gospel to their friends. So, I'm just going to ask this open question. Whoever can answer is what has been the impact of gospel advancing in your ministry? Um, I'll, I'll take uh-huh. this one. Oh, Pauline, let's do one, two ladies first. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, well, as, as I look back, I, I was actually uh, 2014 is when I got involved. So almost, almost 10 years. And, I was always the type to um, say, you know, we got to get going. Like, Jesus is coming. Like, we need Mm -hmm. to get going. Like, let's, like, what are we doing? Thinking discipleship is a group of people in a room talking about the things we already know and not doing what we should be doing. And it wasn't until I went to the Lead the Cause, when it was called Lead the Cause University, that I heard these seven values. And I was like, this is exactly what I've been thinking about. I just didn't know how to articulate it. I had no idea how to put it into words. Um, And during that session, there was a challenge involved where you had to write a bold vision and you had to write this bold vision and it had to pass. Yeah. It was like a gauntlet, like your bold vision had to be good. If it wasn't good, you got put out of the room and told to rewrite it and come back. And I was like, oh, there to share is about that life. <laughs> and so um, I saw people coming out like with their head down, like they didn't make the team. <laughs> and I was like, I have never not made a team in my life. So I'm not going to be that guy. And so um, uh, I sat there and I like everything I could think of that these seven values like took root in and it changed. It changed my life. It changed the way uh, instead of like, OK, students, let's pray. It's like, let me, te- let me teach you how to pray. Mm. Let me teach you how to do evangelism. Uh, leaders, let me um, teach you how to lead. Let's, uh, let's show you how to develop a, you know, discipleship multiplication strategy. Like, it wasn't just, okay, let's do it. It's like, you, like they gave me the tools of how to do the thing. 
uh, but not just how to do it on my own, but even the strategies were even left up to like, you can't do this all on your own. You're going to have to bring in other youth leaders to, to get this uh, mm -hmm. accomplished. And so I, I knew that, but I think it took more convincing of the lead pastor uh, than, than anything. Uh, Cause I, I was already b bought in. Um, so the way I changed me was it just put words to what was already in my heart. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Cause uh and I, I think we had these conversations back at, when it was Lead the Cause University about creating this gospel advancing language mm -hmm. that was already, I think there's a lot of youth leaders that know this in their heart because the Spirit testifies to it because it's all root, rooted in the book of Acts, the gospels, mm -hmm. the way Jesus did ministry, the way the disciples did ministry. And we know something's broken, so this creates that, that language. Pauline, you were going to share something? Oh, yeah. Um, I absolutely love the impact that being gospel advancing has had on not only me as a youth pastor, but also with our students and our leaders, our core team. Um, you know, it gives us a clear target we are aiming for. Um, so before, like, I totally agree with Tyree. I mean, I couldn't articulate what was it that we were missing and really what it comes down to is that the seven values allows us to have tangible mile markers of effectiveness for us to really um, help us stay in our lane, know what we're reaching for, know how to, um, you know, kind of grade how effective we are being with our students to be able to, to um have the right measures in, of the outcomes? Are we being truly effective in their lives? Is there transformation? What does all this look like? So um, just that impact alone <coughs> is definitely worth the price of admission for, for starters. But truly, I mean, it has definitely made us so much more effective in reaching the youth in our community mm. and um, helped me become a youth pastor who's actively sharing their faith out loud with words mm. around me at all times, asking for divine opportunities and accepting those opportunities and then sharing that with our youth group. Um, so it's really activated mm. us as being gospel advancing in our own personal lives. And that has had a catalyst, a huge ripple effect within our youth ministry and our church as a whole. Um, so it's definitely helped us equip students to reach their peers, but their families and the community. So yeah, it's I, been incredible. That's great, Pauline. And I really love the fact that, you know, gospel advancing gets personal. I mean, if we're not living this out, then our kids are going to live this out. And so it, it's like, okay, this is not a program. This is a lifestyle. And mm -hmm. uh, that's a powerful, powerful point. It's given me a clarity of purpose and focus. Mm -hmm. But in a greater way, I've seen significant um, how, how this whole gospelized approach has become a rally point for my students. I remember we came back from Lead the Cause a number of years ago, and you know that's where some of these concepts were talked about, and the seven values and a bold vision, and, and, and just some of these, these tangible ways. And so one of their goals as they came, came out of Lead the Cause was to walk through the gospelized book as students and unpack wow. each of the seven values in more detail. And so I remember the whole next semester of the school year, we sat downstairs on a Sunday after church and we ordered pizza and Cokes and, and we walked through every chapter of the gospelized book and the questions that were at the end of every chapter. And we, we unpacked it um, from a biblical framework, um, but also from a philosophical strategy standpoint. And then we got mm. practical and we evaluated our own ministry said, what are we doing well in? How, are, how can we improve? And the students were owning it. And so it, it really became a, a rally point for them and, and launched us into a whole new level of ministry that wasn't my doing, but our students doing it. And, and it transformed us. And it, and it was me being the coach, not the quarterback. Yeah. I love that. And... <clears throat> It's funny because Gospel Eyes was not written with the teenage audience in mind, but as I think about the broader definition of youth leader, it's a leader of youth, which can be a full-time youth pastor, and it could be a senior in high school that's leading other youth uh, to advance the gospel. So great. That's great. Well, here's my second question. 
uh, it, actually my third, uh, as you read the updated version of Gospelize Your Youth Ministry that literally just came out, uh, what stood out to you the most? And whoever, I mean, all of you don't have to answer. I mean, but if all of you wanted, that's fine. Or just a couple, that's fine. What stood out to you the most? Um, what stood out to me the most was um, when I when I do like workshops with um, youth workers, um, the top two areas that they say they struggle the most in are um, evangelism and discipleship. And so there, I was, it, it, so it was almost like a no brainer to me to see, oh yeah, those two areas, like, uh, like those two chapters definitely had some more, uh, some more information added to them. Uh, because I think if, uh, and, and it's like you universe doesn't matter what audience I'm in front of, right. Those two areas are the areas that they would say, this is where we struggle the most. And yeah. I think it's because they think, you know, there's either two classes. It's either evangelism class or discipleship class. Like it's not the same thing. It's like yeah. either or. And so either we're really good at, we have the evangelism course, but we don't do enough discipleship or we do too much discipleship and we don't do evangelism. Uh, and so, um, I, I, so when I saw that those two chapters um, uh, had more ad added to them, I was like, yes. Uh, that that's that's kind of like a no brainer. Um, the next one that stood out to me, which I think is most important at the season that I'm in right now, is is the networking uh, mm -hmm. part of the book, where it takes it to the next level, uh, which is uh, you know the the fifth stage, which is the movement of how to get other people involved uh, in in this journey. And so I don't know about everybody else's church context. But I would I used to be a part of a church context where you it was almost you it was like a slap on the wrist if you kind of invited other churches like mm -hmm. into the fold if they didn't like submit to everything that we believed, mm -hmm. uh, even if it wasn't in the Bible, right? So and like they had to believe in everything. And so that kind of um that hurt a lot of that hurt a lot of the movement. And as youth workers, we know, like you know, we kind of get down with each other. Like we don't have the same hiccups as as the grown folks do. <laughs> um, yeah. But and, and we kind of and we work well together because we know. Um, I think deep down we know that the city's too big and it can't fit in our youth group. Like it can't fit in our youth room. Uh, like I, I have this phrase: like if your youth room. Uh, isn't as big as a school cafeteria, you're going to need other churches involved. Yeah. Uh, Cause each school has at least like three lunch shifts. And if you don't have a cafeteria three, if you have a youth room three times the size of a school cafeteria, you're not going to be able to reach all the kids. And that's just in a high school or middle school, or elementary school. Right. So yeah. it tells you, you're going to need other people around. So this networking chapter for, for me uh, fits me well uh, because I was able to see, um, again, it articulated the things that I felt in my heart. I just didn't know how to say them out loud with, with words. So that chapter helped a lot. Well, and you know, <clears throat> Tyree, just to kind of build on that, I mean, it is, I, I try to approach it theologically from John 17. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people don't unite because of their theology. And I'm like, you know, listen, unity uh, is a theology too. I mean, with the, the mm -hmm. theology of mm -hmm. Christ, Christ's high, high priestly prayer that we may be one. Again, right. not an ecumenical kind of gooey unity ba based on no truth, but based on the on the thing, the truths that we accept. So I'm glad that you mentioned. It. Anybody else want to share anything? Yeah, I was going to say that <laughs> um, the Gospelized book has been just a amazing resource that is a book that I pick up once a year just to kind of refresh and, and get the encouragement. But the revisions in it, um, just the personal stories from around the world, a clearer, more precise path forward. It's like an apostolic shot of energy into the movement. And those people who, who may be a little bit more reserved of saying uh -huh. like, yeah, I'm not big about evangelism and I'm not so much about our kids going out, um, you know, just set that aside and just realize that the Great Commission has called us to go yeah. and grow. So we need yeah. the both and in that. And so 
Uh, I love the, the reworking of this book in such a way just to, to show how effective it's been all across the world, not just in the country. And so we could hear the stories of impact and even sharing just the stories of impact with other students in the youth room is encouraging that they can be a part of something bigger and greater and how they can do their part right here in their community. Love it. So I love, I, I love that. That's great. Yeah. I just tell you this, it's encouraging for me. Um, we, we went over to Africa and saw how many people are literally getting trained in the seven values. I mean, mm. hundreds of thousands of leaders, which is crazy. I'm not exaggerating. God is, I mean, and that's just the one ministry that's taken this to 31 mm -hmm. nations. Um, and just, you know, I was in the, uh, Maasai market, uh, in Kenya and I started going through the gospel acrostic with this lady named Rose, and she was selling trinkets from the Messiah Warriors, and she started quoting the gospel acrostic. And I'm like, how do you know this? And she said, how do you know this? And I said, I developed the acrostic 32 <laughs> years ago. She goes, no, you didn't. I go, yes, I actually did. She goes, no, you didn't. And I go, how do you know this? And she said, 20 years ago, my pastor... Uh, trained us in these six sentences and had to share Christ <laughs> with six people over the course of six weeks. And she goes, this acrostic changed my life because yeah. I consider myself an evangelist and I share the, I don't just sell things at a market. I share the gospel and I use this. And mm -hmm. I just stood there and wept um, because long before Dare to Share went global, um, you know, the, the gospel was advancing forward. And this pastor, we found out later, had come to America and probably saw the gospel across it in some youth room, took a picture of it, copied it down, came back and built a whole curriculum. I mean, God is advancing his message and his mission all around the world. It's so, so uh, exciting. Yeah. Eric, do you have anything to throw in on that? Well, that, I, one thing that I took away, you know, is that this, the, this philosophy and the strategy, anybody can do it. Uh, and, and your story was just a powerful illustration of that, Greg. I read through this, and as I think again of the disciples, all in the Gospels, and I think of the apostles who were the facts, they were just normal, ordinary people who mm -hmm. were chosen by God, given the power of the Spirit, and the promise of who Jesus was, right? Um, and so that just gives me an incredible amount of encouragement as a youth mm -hmm. worker. And I hope it does to others, too, in the sense that you don't have to be uh, a Greg Steer to implement this personally or in your ministry, right? You, anyone can just pick this up, and, and it's it's tangible and it's practical. Uh, and, and I just want to encourage people, if they're feeling overwhelmed or they feel mm -hmm. like, I, I just don't think I can cut it, um, this is not that. It's it's simple. It's, it's going to take work, yes. But you have the Holy Spirit in you to empower you to do that. So uh, I don't know. It just gave me encouragement as you know, some no namer that I can implement these same strategies that Jesus and the apostles and the disciples did back in the New Testament times. That's awesome. That's yeah, great, Greg. <clears throat> if, uh, yeah. if I if I if I could add, um, I I'm sold on the thought of if. The gospel you're preaching can't be re-preached in a third world country. It's probably not the gospel. Mm. Um, and so when there, it's a no-brainer to me of why someone in another country, a third world country, um, or wherever, that these practices will work. Because, like, the Bible isn't a first world, like, piece of work, right? It's a, it's, it's uh it, it was really it, it was written to, into like a third world country mindset, right? And and so I think we have taken it uh, here in the states, and we have taken it. We've done something different with it um, to where it doesn't fit the context mm. of someone from a third world country. But these values and these principles, because they are biblical, they do work in any context. And so uh, I'm not I'm not surprised at all that it works and wherever it's dropped it. So this will give encouragement to the youth worker that says, oh, it works, it, it'll work for other people, but not me. 
No, literally, like it will work for you because it's biblical. Amen. And, and I, how affirming oh, is that? Yep. Yeah. How affirming is that, that someone seen it, heard it, just a little blip of, of, of it in their life. And now what, 20, 30 years later, they're telling you, the author of the acrostic, <laughs> exactly the seven values and just how impactful and how easy it is for them to hold on to yeah. how to articulate their faith. It is incredible. <clears throat> and our students latch on to it the same way. And we sometimes dismiss students that they're not listening but they're picking up way more than we think they are. I fully, I fully agree. Um, just as a quick side note, uh, those of you listening, watching, uh, this book is available as a free download. I'm sure it's going to be in the show notes. You can just click on that, download the book for free. Also, if you want a hard copy, we, we did get some printed. For those of you watching on video, this is what the book looks like. It's a really cool looking book. Um, our team did a great job designing that. And, uh, yeah, just encourage you, download it for free for all your leaders. If you want a hard copy, just go, uh, again, go to the show notes. You can find out how to get the hard copy or uh, the free download. Um, I just want to kind of open it up. I mean, wrote the book, rewrote the book, had our team really work on it. Uh, a lot of, you know, after seven years, you learn a lot. And that's what's been interesting to me. We've learned a lot from youth leaders across the nation, around the world, and the implementation of these. But as you read it, I just wondered, do, do any of you have any questions about the Gospelized book uh, as you kind of read through it? Do you have any questions that were kind of like, huh, I wonder why, whatever, or what this means? Or if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Yeah, I I, I do. Uh, so okay. I, work, I work in education. And a lot of times... Um, not not in my school, right? <laughs> but in other people's schools, a lot of times uh, things are put into place by people who have never stepped foot in the classroom. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, how in the world am I going to implement this? You have no idea what the classroom even looks like. Um, mm -hmm. So um, with the people at Dare to Share that work at Dare to Share, um, you know, it's not like they are like youth pastors, right? That they report to as a youth pastor somewhere. Uh, how do you feel uh, that God has enabled Dare to Share to be able to um, develop these seven values, right? Mm -hmm. These five stages um, as people, at, almost like administration, right? <laughs> and administration handing down this curriculum to yeah. a teacher that could literally look at it and say, oh my goodness, this is exactly what my classroom needed. Like you would never hear that in the school system. You would never hear, man, the superintendent handed me something that fits very well in my school, con in my classroom context. And you, well, you won't hear, you know that same superintendent that did that all the way over there in California, created something, and it absolutely works in my classroom context. You won't hear, uh, I've been, uh, Superintendent in Puerto Rico created something in Puerto Rico and it fits my school, right? So you have created something as like administrators, right? That fits in every youth group classroom context. Um, and my question is, in short, how? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, how? that's a that's a great question, and I think a couple different answers to it. Number one. We have a penchant toward youth leaders and toward the church. I was a youth leader myself. I was a pastor of a church. So we kind of think through that lens to begin with. We have staff members that were recent youth pastors, and some of them still volunteers at their church that had a youth pastor perspective. For instance, although the book has got an extra chapter, it, the whole book overall is shorter. I don't know if you noticed that. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, you got you say too many words, Greg. There's too many. You don't need all that. And uh, did I hear a niner in there? Anyway, uh, so so that and then also, you guys know you're part of the council. We have a council of youth leaders that we meet with on a monthly basis that we get input and ideas from. We also have a pretty strong uh, global feedback loop uh, and Facebook page where we get a lot of. Uh, youth leader input. And we just, we're the kind of ministry that runs stuff by people. I, I'm the kind of, I just mm -hmm. run stuff by people because I want to make sure it's practical, usable, biblical, all that stuff. So 
that's a couple different answers to your question, but we want to, you know, it's like when my son wanted to go hunting uh, when he was 12 or 13. He goes, Dad, I want to go hunting, but you don't know anything about hunting. I go, Jeremy, you got to either be the man or know the man. And I know the man. And I called my friend Donnie <laughs> Coxey, and he hooked us up, and we all went out, and, you know, he, he knows what he's doing, right? Well, we know the men and women uh, that are doing this. You guys are part of that team. Uh, and other youth leaders that we lean into to get that feedback loop going to make sure it's practical and biblical and doable. So, yeah, good. Any other questions? Greg, what would you comment, if you could just comment to a youth worker, maybe they're a volunteer, they're not the lead youth worker, or they are, but they uh, are struggling getting traction with their upper uh, leadership. Uh, it's church leadership or their key yeah. youth pastor. Um, they get this book, they they catch the vision, they're on track, but they're not in a position to personally implement it. How would you coach them? Yeah. How would you train them, give them insight on that to, to keep pressing on with this vision? Yeah, I would say, uh, number one, pray. Uh, just, you know, when Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 10, you know, to, about tearing down strongholds, he said, taking captive every thought, you know, with the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world, but we, you know, we tear down strongholds. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. He's actually talking about discipleship. He's talking about tearing down strongholds in the Corinthians' mm -hmm. hearts and minds that were keeping them from spiritual growth. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to pray. And we need to persuade. We need to, you know, pray for people, care for our leaders, and share this vision with them, and keep doing that uh, until, you know, uh, it's like chopping down a tree. You, you know, you keep chopping, and it doesn't usually come down in the first swing. You have to keep chopping, and eventually it falls down. And in the process, you get jacked, right? <laughs> and in the same way, we pray, we care, we share, we trust the Lord, we persevere until that stronghold falls. And in the process, our faith is getting growing stronger. Um, so don't give up. Cast a vision. There's also the old Stephen Covey circle of influence and circle of concern that you may have a huge circle of concern that this is not being implemented in your youth ministry, but a small circle of influence. Well, the rule of thumb is if you focus on your circle of concern, your circle of influence actually shrinks. But if you focus on your circle of influence, so maybe you're in charge of five middle school boys, well, start implementing these values with them. You know, just start praying for them, start giving them gospel urgency, influency, and strategy, and uh, teaching them to pray for their friends. And as that grows, it's going to begin to crowd out that circle of concern uh, because the youth leader may be coming to you saying, hey, what are you doing with your small group? Because whatever it is, it's thriving. So just go with, you know, you know, grow where you're planted and pray, 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 pray. So good. Well, listen, as we, we're going to wrap up the podcast for today, running out of time here, but uh, is there one piece of advice you would give to someone just starting out on their gospel advancing ministry journey? What one piece of advice would you give? Um, outside of pray, right? Because we know that's a given. Um, I would say, sadly, sadly, it, Tyree, it, it's not a yeah. given. It should be okay. a given. But that's, yeah, that's true. Okay, we'll start. All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we start well, with prayer. Then, <laughs> right? Okay, Af after prayer, yeah. um, and this is really going to sound like a plug. I honestly would say, like, join the Gospel Advancing Ministry Facebook page. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of groups out there, and you'll learn how to play a lot of really cool games, right? Like your kids would be great at dodgeball and it would be awesome at nine square. Right. Um, but when they graduate, they won't know how to share the gospel or do a Bible study with the person in their dorm room. Right. Um, but there's something different about this group of youth workers that are on this page. Um, it's not, it's, it's not, and it, and it probably won't ever be a hundred thousand members because like, like discipleship, not a lot of people show for discipleship. Um, but what you'll find in this group is you'll find youth workers that are really about that life. 
Like yeah. they're really about that grind. They're really about uh, my, how do I lead this whole thing, but how do I involve my students? How to involve my leaders? And it lets you know that you're not alone and there's a community out there. I, I really think that's important. And I would say you can join both. Uh, I mean, you can, it's, it, there's a need for Facebook yeah. pages with games and curriculum. That's, that's a necessary part. And I think community and camaraderie is great. Right. I think at the same time, getting involved with the Gospel Advancing Ministry Facebook page will give you ideas that you can share and actually share on those other pages to right. encourage them as they, as they're doing youth ministry and curriculum. Hey, let's do it with a purpose and toward toward a goal. So uh, so important. Uh, I just recently did this, joined this thing called Fit Fathers for old dads over forty and fifty years old. I'm fifty seven, and they got kind of this thirty day thing. It's it's pretty good. I, I'm enjoying it. But they have a Fit Fathers Brotherhood Facebook page, and they have a Fit Mothers Sisterhood Facebook page, right. <laughs> and they hold each other accountable and stuff. And I'm like, you know. It just reminded me of the value of our gospel advancing ministry Facebook page. We can pray for each other, hold each other accountable, and really help the the youth leaders that are doing it well, that have got our veterans, that have experience, helping these other youth leaders to just brand new, like, where do I start? What do I do? So great first piece of advice, join the gospel advancing ministry Facebook page. All right. Uh, Pauline, what, what piece of advice would you have for youth leaders? Yeah, I would just have to reiterate everything everybody's just said, you know, pray, implement the seven values within your circle of influence, and don't do it alone. Whether you, you pull one person aside, or you join a network altogether of people who are willing to do the seven values and implement the gospel advancing philosophies within your, your youth ministry, don't do it alone. Do it with another youth pastor, youth leader, yeah. get a couple people at your church, um, you know, you can always give us a call and, and reach out to any one of us at any point in time. We'd love to help you and come alongside of you. But there's others who want to join in the journey. It doesn't matter if you're the only church in the county or if you are one of several mm. within a small town. Um, you know, there's somebody who's willing to go go with the goers. Yeah. And in the process, you're going to see that that level of influence grow. And you'll see the impact. And one of the things I was going to mention to you, Greg, was like, when are you going to make, you know, revise this book in such a way where you take out youth ministry? Because this is practical for all of our ministry yeah. efforts everywhere. You know, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you're gospel advancing. Yeah. End of story. And it doesn't matter if you're a, a teen or an adult. So this is going to be a huge movement, but it's going to be led by our, our teenagers. You know, what's cool is uh, I did a little hat tip in the new gospel eyes to churchwide gospel advancing. I told the story of Coachella Valley and how the 60 churches in the Coachella Valley are all uniting together around the seven values to create the biggest outreach, uh, not only in the valley, but also to Coachella, the con uh, concert. Like when they come into town, now they're going to have a bunch of youth groups and adults <laughs> Trained and equipped, and we did a training over there. We had 150 show up. It was the week after Dare to Share Live, and they were probably at average age 65. And they're like, and they all went out sharing the gospel and came back and shared stories. They're like, we're going to go. reach Let's this go. city. I'm like, yeah. yeah. All right, Eric, what one piece of advice do you have? Yeah, I, you know, my experience, I would just say be patient. Expect yeah. difficulty, but persevere through it because the growth is coming. Um, that's great. This is this is an adjustment for some people and for some uh, church leadership, or even for students and parents. They they have a different expectation or, or an approach, and so you got to be patient. You know, you got to pray and you got to persevere and you got to expect the the resistance is going to come. Uh, but keep that vision in mind that God has given you of what it means to mm. enable, to equip, and unleash your students in your community. And, and hold tight to that. Don't let your grip go. Um, yeah. So you got to be patient. It's going to take some time. Yeah. Good, but it's worth it. And, and all good I love things it. are. Right? That's great. My one piece of advice would be, <clears throat> and I don't want this to sound self-serving, but it's a free ebook. So <laughs> download the ebook and read it. Uh, really process through it. 
You could take your whole team through it. There's questions at the end of every chapter. Process through. And to Eric's point, be patient. Uh, this is this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. This is not just a program. You're one and done. This is changing a culture, uh, which takes tearing down strongholds, which takes prayer, which means you're going to get spiritual resistance against Satan. Um, some parents may not like where you're going. Some teenagers may not like where you're going. But you are the youth leader, so lead the way uh, in the guidance of the Holy, in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, and step at a time uh, doing all this. So, hey, thank you all for joining uh, me on this podcast, and uh, thank you for reading the book. Thank you for living this stuff out. I respect every single one of you. I want to say this to the youth leaders again: get the word out about this podcast, download the Gospelized book, look to the show notes for more information, and remember that a thriving youth ministry is a gospel-advancing youth ministry.